All right, I'm Adib. Um, I'm the Chief Product Officer here at Karma. I lead the OpenPilot team, and I'm going to talk about how we actually ship OpenPilot. Um, so we have a saying at Karma. We say the difference is shippability. Um, we've been saying this since the beginning. Um, it's a pretty important core tenet of Karma. Uh, everything we do is designed to be shippable. We don't, as, as Harold showed, we don't really spend time on things that we don't think we can ship. Um, we always develop something to be sh at least have an intermediary that we can ship first, um, even if we can't ship the very final system. Um, so Harold showed you a bunch of cool things um, that the research team develops. Um, they tell the car where to go. Um, but then what do you do after that? Um, you've got these really fancy machine learning models. Uh, they tell the car where to drive, how fast to drive, and they can even navigate now. Um, but how does that get to you in OpenPilot? So first we need some hardware, and this is what comes in your car. It's a lane keep camera. It's got a very tiny amount of compute. Um, so unfortunately we can't run OpenPilot on it. Um, it's also got no video output, so we don't get a raw camera stream out of it. Um, and it's different in every car. So that means for every car we'd have to not only reverse engineer the messages to read the state from the car and send the actuation, we'd also have to figure out how to interface with it, possibly get a camera stream out of it, um, and figure out how to run it on that processor. Um, so this one has a mobile eye chip. Uh, so instead, since we can't use this, what we do is we ship the Comma 3, we launch this at last Comic-Con, and it has everything you need to run OpenPilot. It's got three cameras, it's got a Snapdragon 845, so every single one has the same processor, whether you have a Toyota Corolla, a Hyundai Sonata, or a Honda Civic. And it's got enough compute to run modern machine learning models, um, and it interfaces with every single car exactly the same way. And the way we do this is we take PCBs into our office, and common threes come out. So the first step in this process is something called circuit spoke. Um, the original Comma 3s you may have bought towards last year's Comic-Con, or two years ago, um, were made by a manufacturer called Circuit Hub. We replaced them with something called Circuit Spoke that's in our office. Um, ever since we moved, we've been running Comma 3s there. They come in with bare PCBs, just like that. And then they run through this line. We have a jet printer, a pick and place, an oven, and some fancy AOI. And then they get headed off to the production room right over there. And then it goes off to assembly. You can see a bunch of Comma 3 boards here. Um, lots of stuff on them. And then they get provisioned, stress tested, and you order them at shop.com with AI. We fulfill the next day. We fulfill every day. Um, so now we've got some hardware. Um, next, we need to run on a car. So we know self-driving is entirely a software problem, um, but now we explain why we need to start with hardware. But fortunately, we don't need to build a car. Um, modern cars are more than good enough. They've got lane keeping, so we can control the steering um, by using the same inputs and the same with the gas and the brakes. So here's the Toyota Prius, a very early supported car for OpenPilot. Um, so for each car, we need hardware to attach the Comma 3. That's a little bit more specific than the Comma 3. So every pin out um, on the camera connector um, that I showed previously is different. Uh, so we have a little bit of special hardware for your car, but the compute isn't. And then we need some special software for your car to read and write to it. And we've done this about 250 times um, for the 250 officially supported cars, and there's many, many more in uh, community supported forks. So this is the car harness. This is, the, uh, this is the end that goes into your car. This is the end that goes into the Comma 3. Each car and brand, uh, each brand and model tend to need a different uh, wiring harness. They provide power and access to the CAN bus, and that's how we talk to the car. We have 34 different harnesses that cover our 250 supported cars. Um, so now that we're attached to the car, we need to be able to read and write from it. So each brand, again, has its own messages that need to be reverse engineered after we've already connected to the car. Um, and then we read 
a bunch of signals like speed, steering angle, um, whether the car's at standstill, um, the steering torque that you are putting on the wheel. We read out a whole bunch of things, and then we need to be able to send steering, gas, and brakes to your car. All right, now I'm going to talk about something that's pretty exciting, uh, open pilot safety. So this is something you don't expect, uh, or you might not expect, you know. You have a machine learning model that tells you where to go. We have a planner, we have a control stack. Um, but how do you constrain that output? How do you, make, how do you ship this in a continual way um, where you don't have to think about these things in this stack? How do we abstract out the safety from this? So we have something called the open pilot safety model. And it guarantees a couple things. So first it says that the driver must always be able to take control of the vehicle by stepping on the brake pedal or the cancel button. So this means you're able to engage open pilot and take control whenever you want. Um, and then we have um, this next point, which means essentially open pilot can't react um, or do anything too quickly for an attentive driver to not have enough time to take over. So we enforce this safety, um, and through that, open pilot is able to pretty much make whatever decisions it wants and it's constrained by the safety model as long as we do a good job of enforcing that. So there's some pretty good standards around this that allow us to formalize the safety model, give it specific actuation limits, and uh, give us a good way to think about safety. So ISO 15622 gives us some good guidelines for ACC. Um, and then there's another ISO standard 11270 for lane keep. Uh, we recently updated our safety documentation with some of these actuation limits so that they're more, uh, they're more formal. You can go in, you can read these documents. They're very readable. Um, they're like 15-page PDFs. Um, this stuff is very accessible. Um, and then you have ISO 262, which is just kind of a general framework for thinking about functional safety for road vehicles. And then we have something called the Panda. Um, so the Panda in your comma 3 doesn't look quite like this, but uh, this is an external Panda for CanFD cars. It's a secondary processor that directly talks to the car. So uh, a common thing you might see about OpenPilot on the internet is that, you know, I don't want a phone driving my car. Well, the phone isn't driving your car. This is the thing that talks to your car. Um, I, I think it's an important point because this is one of the coolest parts of OpenPilot. You know, you can have a fork and the Panda protects you. You don't touch the Panda and uh, you should be in good shape. So the Panda has all the code that enforces the safety and it allows OpenPilot to be something called QM. Um, so there's this framework for thinking about safety called ASL. It stands for Automotive Safety Integrity Level. And then there's something uh, below the ASL ratings called QM. And this stands for Quality Management. Um, and what that means is any, anything OpenPilot wants to do, as long as it's constrained properly by the Panda safety, it's at worst considered bad quality. Um, it, essentially has no safety implications in regards to the safety model. Um, so when you're talking about open pilot safety, first you should read the safety model, and then you should go, okay, is the Panda properly enforcing the safety model? And if that's the case, then whenever open pilot makes a decision that you felt was unsafe, you have a proper way to think about um, whether this was actually unsafe. It provides some very specific language to talk about this, and we're uh, quite strict about how we communicate this um, because it's really important to think about it in this way. And the Panda goes through lots of testing and it has very rigorous code standards. Uh, we observe MISR C and all relevant automotive safety guidelines there. And now I want to talk a little bit about testing. Um, so you've got a system, but how do you continually ship it? So we ship open pilot updates to master several times a day and we ship OpenPilot updates to our release users roughly every month. Um, and you might be surprised to know that the releases go through very little specific testing. Um, we have really great uh, testing infrastructure that we try to get as early as possible. So that means when we're pushing code directly to master, we expect to find those failures pretty immediately on master. Um, by the time something hits release, it's pretty rare to find a bug. You might have noticed we don't really ship hotfixes anymore. Um, things are getting quite stable. Um, on that front in the 09 Open Pilot series. So back in 2016, there's a fun quote. Um, I found this commit. This was uh, well before my time, um, towards the start of the company. 
and it says, one day we'll have CI. Um, so today we do have CI. And the test suite looks a little bit something like this. We don't test in cars. This is the first principle. If you have to go down to a car, first it's slow. All the cars are different. Um, it, it's not a good loop. So we run regression tests in the cloud with GitHub Actions. We have hardware in the loop tests that run on tons and tons of real comma threes. Um, and then we have dozens of comma threes running open pilot continuously. Um, but the CI is getting so good that these dozens of comma threes really don't find anything. It's getting quite boring. Um, you just see them driving and driving and driving. And uh, it's um, really pretty incredible the way we can ship things now to open pilot master. And I don't know how many of you run master or uh, try to run the bleeding edge. I suspect many of you do uh, if you showed up here. Um, but I, I think you haven't seen a regression in quite a while. So I'm going to talk a little about one of our tests. Uh, it's called process replay. And it allows us to deterministically replay uh, all of our driving processes. So that means you have the driving model, for example. We give it the same video. And then we say, OK, what do the outputs look like? Do they look exactly the same for the same inputs? Um, and this essentially outputs a diff in the outputs of the process given two commits. So you can say, uh, I have this good known commit. Uh, this is good known behavior. And what is the deviation from that good known behavior? You get a green check mark if there's no difference. And if there are differences, it's really easy to go in and say, OK, this is an expected difference. And an, uh, or this isn't an expected difference. Um, and I messed something up. And the real power in this is it makes refactors essentially free. Um, you know when you're doing a refactor and you, you're changing something, you're like, oh, I don't really know if this is the same. You know, you run it a little bit, and you're like, okay, this looks roughly the same. With process replay, uh, your coverage is only constrained by the inputs. If you want more coverage, you throw more data at it. You can generate data that'll be relevant for what you're doing, but um, we just throw in lots of segments from lots of different cars, and we get great coverage that runs on every single open pilot commit and gives you a diff from the last known good open pilot commit. So this allows, uh, I think, research right before the release merged a fairly large refactor to RadarD. They were able to run it through process replay and a larger version of process replay that they maintain. And uh, it was, I mean, nobody was concerned about this before the release. Um, it was just business as usual. All right, so this is uh, kind of the most important thing in testing. Green check mark means good to go. If you don't trust your CI, then it, there's almost no point. So every time you commit, you should be very confident when you get that green check mark that you're ready to merge this and nothing, is, nothing unexpected will happen, essentially. Um, sometimes there's, there's good uh, red Xs. We have some cool tests like a power draw test that asserts that essentially every driving process doesn't use uh, more or less power than expected. Um, so we've had some fun ones like that where um, we've done some optimization, you get a red check mark, and it's like, okay, I, I lowered power usage. Um, and then we can adjust the thresholds, and we can say, uh, this will not regress in the future because we test this explicitly on every single commit. Um, and it's similar with CPU usage, memory usage, all those kinds of things. All right, so this robust testing infrastructure enables us to ship open pilot updates extremely regularly. Um, there's essentially no uh, bottleneck on shipping to master, you have a green check mark, then you're, you, you feel very confident. Sometimes you might you know, ask somebody for a review, but uh, really the machines are doing your reviews for you. Um, they're enforcing essentially all the behavior we want to enforce. And this allows us to support all the 400 plus contributors we have now. Um, it's nearly double since last Comic Con. Um, and it's pretty incredible. We hit 10,000 commits. Um, we have of those 10,000 commits, I, I think about 30% of them are from external contributors um, who, you know, you can't expect an external contributor to do too much validation. It works on their device, works on their car, improves their experience. Um, but it's always hard to expect them to do the validation uh, when they're not the ones clicking the merge button. So we've really removed that burden on ourselves in the same way that they go through the same workflow that we do um, to validate our changes. And I think a really cool feature of this is we have 250 supported cars. This has grown, again, double since last Comic-Con. I think it was 134 last Comic-Con. Uh, and it's a single engineer maintaining all those cars. We're expanding car support. We support all major brands now. Um, we recently merged support for Ford. Um, and 
it's, uh, it allows the community to really, uh, the community is really able to uh, leverage our CI and we just, uh, we're able to validate their stuff so quickly that uh, we can have one person who just builds tests and infrastructure for them and then we merge their carports um, and it's a really great pipeline now. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about what's next for OpenPilot. Now that you have an idea of kind of how we ship OpenPilot. Um, we ship little boxes to you guys. Um, I showed you a little bit about the procedure for that. Um, and then, you know, there's some unexpected hiccups. You know, you need to do some safety. You need to do some testing so that you can ensure that you're continuously shippable. Um, but what are we shipping next? So this is something from the Taco video. We had to bump up the low speed torque um, the way we implement the safety for our torque-based cars right now is um, it, it trades off some implementation simplicity for maximizing torque at all speeds. Um, because for a, essentially for a given, uh, you can only maximize your lateral accel acceleration for a given torque at um, a narrow speed range. So that means at the low end, you're not getting as much torque. Um, so in the future, what we'll do is we'll be able to look at the speed uh, and the panel will say, okay, you can get a little bit more torque at the low end and then we'll be able to give you a consistent amount of lateral acceleration across the whole speed range rather than at one narrow point where we maximize on the highway. Um, and then this is another interesting one coming up. A lot of cars are coming out as vision only. They don't have radars. Um, so we've got to start doing comma A, B. We want to, this is a milestone that we need to hit for OpenPilot 1.0. Um, this is a video from when we did our first AB tests, um, when we were doing uh, some more of our, uh, some safety work on, uh, we wanted to validate that essentially, we passed through the, the AB messages and that it still works. Um, so this is the first time we did that. Um, we built this car, this is how we do it. Um, and some systems are a lot better than others. You should go and read the blog post. I pulled this picture from there. It's really great. We analyzed the, uh, the manufacturer AB systems and we, we compare them, we benchmark them, and we can compare them even to OpenPilot's forward collision warning, which is really pretty, uh, pretty good and really suitable enough to ship an AEB. But then again, there's a lot of safety work that's needed to ship AEB. You don't want to just uh, trigger at any time. It also extends the safety model. We're going to trigger when you're not engaged. Um, so there's quite a bit of safety work that goes into this. All right, and then we want to ship to more robots. Harold talked a little bit about this. Um, this is going to require some refactors to support cleanly. The common body fit in pretty cleanly as a car, um, but we want to support more robots. You might have noticed the self-drive to system refactor in OpenPilot. We're going to keep working on that, um, and it should be really easy to integrate in any of your robotics projects. And then uh, we're trying to make everything more plug and play. You might have had to fingerprint your car. I see there's a lot of users here. Um, hopefully you didn't have to, but this is a metric we're starting to track now. Uh, we refer to it as TTFF, um, that's a GPS acronym that stands for time to first fix. The OpenPilot team has uh, kind of commandeered it to mean time to first fingerprint. So the, what this shows is how many users every day didn't hit a successful fingerprint, who should have. Essentially, they bought a Comma 3, they saw their Toyota Corolla was supported, they put it in their car and it said car unrecognized. Um, so this is something we're fixing. It turns out we, uh, we were very conservative in the beginning. We pinned to exact, like these firmware strings we get from the car. Um, and it turns out, you know, they don't change their APIs that often. We can look at these firmware versions a little bit more, and we can essentially, if we say we support the Toyota Corolla, you plug in a comma three, it'll just work. So we shipped the first version of that for Hyundai's in 093. Um, Toyotas are coming up next, and we'll extend it to all the cars. All right, and now I want to shout out our external contributors. We have 474 as of uh, this morning. So. If we can get a developers, developers, developers for our external contributors in three, two, one. Developers. Developers, developers. All right, time for questions. So you can ask me questions about OpenPilot, the product, the production process, um, really anything like that.
No. So we actually run these on the CPU in uh, GitHub Actions. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there's actually some brands where the EPS does this for you. Um, so like the Chevy Bolt is like this. Um, yeah. You oh, want to repeat uh, that? yeah. So the question is, um, like, what's the best car brand or or even model specific model that has like the uh, the highest low speed torque limit? So there's some cars that are uh, all these APIs are different uh, amongst the cars. Um, the Chevy Bolt happens to be one that already has good low speed torque because they already compensate for this um, when you request the torque. So that's one you can get right now that'll have really great low speed torque. All right, I'm back here. Well, you have a Chevy Bolt. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for your presentation. I always love uh, anything on CI. Um, so <laughs> in, in, in your replays, I guess you're, you're kind of trying to see if the car or, or, or the new release yeah. does the proper behavior again. You don't have a regression. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, and I, I'm asking this because I'm kind of interested in this, this project called Vision Zero, okay. right? Um, do, you, do you have any testing techniques or know of any testing techniques for say reproducing adverse events like collisions? Like can you kind of test for, hey, does a certain type of behavior in a car actually cause a collision? So these tests are a little bit different. They're lower level than that. <laughs> so what we test for is we take each individual process and processes really only do, uh, they have very narrow scopes. So we'll say like, is the car parsing, we take in CAN messages and we say, did we parse the same car state out from this? Um, so it, it's much lower level. You probably wanna ask the research team this question. Um, they have really great tests for this stuff. Thanks so much for that feedback, it's super useful. Uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about your segments you use for testing and validation? You mentioned, um, do you, are you kind of continually changing those out over time as you get fresher data for, off of more recent open pilot versions? Or is it kind of just one big list of segments that you're continuously building on over time? So the big list we build on over time is the ones for cars. Um, we have several test segments for each car we support. Um, and we have like this 200 line unit test. It's really great. Uh, and it basically ensures the cars never break. Um, this was this turned out to be a problem um, up until maybe a year or two ago, where uh, you know there'd be some minor regression in all these cars, especially since we don't have one from each platform. Um, so that one we continue to build on over time. Um, for other tests, you generally get a pretty good coverage um, from. So we have to update them uh, occasionally when there's new outputs and new inputs. But uh, largely, no, we don't have to. The next step for this is like fuzzy testing. Um, and you want to really search over that whole space and uh, make sure you get full coverage um, and generate the data. Hi, I have a question. Um, which car brands are the easiest to support and the hardest to support? And do you have any thoughts on their software engineering practices and quality? <laughs> um, so easiest to support, this is really changing now actually. Um, the software platforms in the cars, at least for the ADAS, um, were pretty stable for about like three, four years. And we did a lot of this initial work maybe three, four years ago. And now we're in this cycle where, you know, Honda, Toyota, Hyundai, a lot of them are changing their, uh, their platforms right at the same time. So uh, that's the hard part right now, is we're getting kind of this influx that are all different right now. Um, the hardest ones now are the ones that implement um, the Autosar uh, secure onboard communication. We haven't spent much time on it, but uh, that'll be a little bit of a project. It just adds more overhead to porting a car. And you, I think you had a second question. Oh, the, the software engineering practices. Oh, um, I mean, we reverse everything. So sometimes we see some fun stuff, but largely it's, you know, it's the practices of the tier one. Um, the worst part is sometimes the APIs just don't make any sense at all and we have to hack around that. Hi, I have a question on the community collaboration. So yeah. um, what's the expectation as far as for you know, proper communication and also the quality of the PRs that we do? Like what, what's that like? And uh, we have a lot of PRs that's being, you know, being, being um, opened with, co with uh, open pilot uh, repo, but yeah. uh, always getting a lot of time, like the time to get them merged or get them 
you know, even review, it's a long time. So what's the expectation that um, the external developers or collaborators should be expecting? So um, as far as communication, um, we tend to merge the things that are pretty immediately mergeable pretty quickly. And then we have to prioritize essentially what is valuable to us right now. Um, there's a lot of the ones that are open are, um, maybe there's like a lot of refactors that are like of questionable value that maybe we should just close. Um, and perhaps we should have some kind of auto close mechanism that's, um, we can certainly improve this. But uh, for things that are like pretty immediately valuable, we'll try to provide good feedback um, immediately and try to get them merged. But it, it essentially goes through the same uh, prioritization as the stuff we work on. It's, it's really quite a small team um, that's looking at this stuff. Hi, so um, for all the uh, testings that are being done on OpenPilot, what's yeah. the process like of uh, developing a test case? Developing a test case. Okay, so usually the way this works is you write something, and then you say, okay, I'm not sure if this is... Uh, this is gonna work quite the way I expect, then you write the test case. Um, so generally, we have a lot of the kind of general test cases that are end-to-end -end written already, and then now it's more of a specific unit test cases that get written. I mean, you could look at the, I was looking at the open file commit history this morning, actually, um, to get a nice picture for something, and uh, it's like mostly tests, so that's what you see these days. Things that like regress a little bit, and we write a test for and we say, okay, this is never regressing again. Hey, uh, just wondering if you could share any insights into your AEV deep dive, which brands did well, which brands did not. So Honda Bosch, I believe, was, uh, was the worst performing. Um, that was actually fun. When we were testing it, we had to put a license plate on it. I think we had to put a German license plate to get it to trigger. Um, yeah. So the funny thing is they released the testing procedure, so you can kind of engineer it. Um, it's kind of like the fuel emission stuff where you know sometimes they engineer a sort of demo essentially for when they do the test. Um, but again, it, it's we'd have to like fully reverse the systems to understand how it works. It might have actually been looking for something that was real. Um, but it's probably time to redo that test. We have, we support a lot more cars now, and we can do, redo that blog post. Um, I had a question on steer torque. Do you yeah. only do you only use torque for for uh, rate limiting, or do you use steer angle? ever? Uh, so it depends on the car. Uh, we essentially want to limit the, the two things we want to limit are lateral acceleration and jerk. Um, these are actually specified in ISO 11270. Um, so we have to limit essentially what the car gives us. We develop a safety model or a safe, an implementation of the safety model for each car as it comes. Uh, we re recently supported the Fords um, and those, you know, they don't take torque. Um, we give it curvature. We have to develop something around that. Um, fortunately, for a lot of the EPSs, or, uh, don't provide enough torque to, that exceed the ISO 11270 limits. Some do, um, and we, but we implement the safety nonetheless for all of them. You spoke a lot about cloud testing with CI, yeah. um, but you sometimes do hardware in the loop tests. So, can you elaborate more on um, how and when you do those and? Any best practices you adhere to? Yeah. So best practice here is we do them on every single commit. Um, there, if the test is something you have to run manually, it's just not going to get done sometimes. Uh, you're less likely to also make the change that you want to make. Um, the, the best feeling about CI is like, you know, when you're at home, you want to make a change, and you're like, you know, open file, it's public. It's really easy to like go in the GitHub editor. It's like, oh, let me make this quick change. Um, and it's like, do I commit to master the, the small change? Do you open a PR? Um, and uh, you see the green check and you just merge it. Uh, it's like, I, I don't feel like it's gonna, you, you feel really good that it's not gonna break master. Um, and I, I do this pretty often, where I go home at night, I'm like, oh, I wanna make this quick change. I end up merging it that night, go to sleep, and I'm not worried it's gonna break master. Because we do have like 400 users who run the very, very bleeding edge. Um, so if it does break master, they'll let us know pretty quickly. Um, uh, Hi. Um, it sounds like you do uh, a, a, a CI on pretty much every commit. Yep. Um, does that also go for uh, hardware and loop testing, or is that more less frequent, rather? Nope. Okay. On every single commit. And in that case, um, how 
how long do you run those hardware in the loop tests? Because I've seen open pilot bugs that don't manifest until the com has been running for a few days. Um, uh, like what kind of bugs? Like uh, uh, low IPC rate errors, um, a failure to engage after being on, um, doesn't turn off when the battery gets low, things like that. Do you run a fork? No, just a uh, regular oh. release channel. Oh, okay, we should talk about that after maybe. But uh, so we have some different infrastructure for that. We call it the testing closet because it actually started in a closet in our maybe two offices ago um, when we were in a house. And it's essentially just dozens of Comma 3s running continuously. Um, and the hardware and the loop tests are like normal unit tests that need to run on the real hardware um, to validate some, um, some things that we can't reproduce on uh, like Cloud CI runners, like using the DSP and the 845. I had a question. Uh, what motivated the desire to actually assemble the PCBs and boards in-house? Like, what problems oh, did you guys run into from so these, like, contract manufacturers? We uh, use this company called Circuit Hub, and you know you we got boards. Throw them under the bus. What's up? <laughs> they were good for the comma two. They weren't good for the comma three. Yeah. Things got too complicated. And now that we have this, it was, uh, it's really incredible for prototyping. We can like, essentially have CI order boards every Friday, and it makes so much sense. It's like $200 for a bunch of boards. We just run them through the line. It's really fast and easy. Uh, doing revs of the Comma 3 took forever. Um, so it's, uh, it's really a superpower in that regard, too. But uh, we've been doing some really great tuning over the last couple of weeks on the line. And... Uh, Find like the really littlest things. Uh, we catch it in production, we stop the line immediately, we go and fix the thing, you know, and we're able to do the same things we do in production, but on the boards themselves. Yeah, we yeah. can tweak every little detail. Yes. Uh, I just have a question on capacity. Have a, we ever have capacity issues ever? And uh, mo when multiple users are using, uh, using the software or whatever, or something like that. It, does that ever cause peak and have to distribute it? I'm s sorry, what kind of issues? Uh, uh, my question is related to capacity. So. Oh, capacity issues. Yes, I will ever run out of capacity issues and then how we distribute the multiple users using the same time, like uh, does that the peak, uh, you know, the peak volumes for that? Multiple users using at the same time? Yes. Well, everything runs on your device, so there's no issues like that. You don't need to connect to the cloud except for Navigate on OpenPilot, but that just hits like a, a tile server and a routing server. So uh, the load is pretty low there. Uh, do you have any kind of special process to integrate tests for driving feedback you get from users for like consistent disengagement spots across OpenPilot versions? Um, like for instance, there's an express lane that I drive on and it's consistently taken, tried to take the exit um, across, you know, OP 090, 91, 92, it did good on the way to the airport uh, a few days ago on uh, 9.4, but I had a lead car in front of me, so I think that definitely played into it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so about that. Um, driving behavior questions are generally best asked uh, for the research team. Wei is going to have some really great stuff on this, uh, on like this engagement analysis. Um, we have a driving feedback channel in Discord where there's like a nice form. You give it a route as long as you upload all your logs. So the, if you ever want something looked into by us, we love looking at the bug reports, uh, but they have to be, you know, you have to put in the effort to make it really high quality. Um, I mean, just put in the effort and it'll be high quality. So don't worry too much about like, don't worry whether it is high quality. So just um, continue to make the reports, because I've, yeah. I've reported them all, you know, I try to do oh, okay. the feedback, but um, just was curious if you had a specific process to like prioritize those or, you know, kind of make sure that there's no regressions. Um, so we do look at everything in that channel. We look at everything that's reported, essentially, and we, if it's something that looks a little bit concerning or that looks like a regression, we'll evaluate whether it actually is or it regressed in like some very minor cases, and we, we prioritize that way. We do look at everything that comes in. So Thank you. It, it's not always easy to respond to, though. Yeah, generally, I would just like to thank everyone who's made a good bug report. Um, I think people don't realize how valuable. Yes, give it up for bug reporters. Um, yeah, that slide really should have been bug reports, bug reports, bug reports. Truly, I think people may um, not really fully realize how valuable the reports can be to the team. You know, we're the team's so small, and we have about 12 cars ourselves. 
I feel like we don't, we don't talk too much about our cars, but, you know, so we're testing things, but I think people don't realize how many varieties of cars, how different each car is. Um, and so it's super helpful to the team to have that information when they're doing bug reports. Um, we have time for a few more questions down here. I'm gonna, great, I will come back over. So I'm just gonna reword a question I think I heard because I think it was a really important one. Okay. So you have a closet or room of hardware that runs hardware and loop tests. You might also have some infrastructure that can run tests, like unit tests. Yeah. When are times when that hardware or infrastructure sort of maxes out because you have too many requests to run tests? Or do you not observe that so happening? It's, this is an open source project. GitHub gives us um, GitHub Actions runners for free. Um, we actually like upgraded our GitHub plan so that we get more concurrent runners. And it was like, I don't know, a few hundred dollars more a month. And we just get unlimited CI from GitHub uh, every month because we're an open source product. So that's really cool. And then as far as the hardware test, we have to scale those sometimes. Um, and we just add more devices in the closet. That's a little bit hard to maintain um, because the team is so small, but um, we were generally able to keep up with that. You guys, the testing closet is like a nightclub. It's just, it's very loud. It's very important, yeah, I keep, I keep it I right next to my desk. I don't know how Adib works uh, around all the alerts. <laughs> Oh yeah, I just have a question about like um, safety, uh, which is related to like uh, total model failures. So I had a situation one day, it, it might sound just unbelievable, but like a bird like took a dump and it hit r on right where the camera is looking and, and it covered a lot of the camera and then yeah. the car, uh, the model didn't like, it didn't give any warnings or, but it was a model failure and the car just went straight. And I, I had to immediately disengage and turn on my windshield wiper. Yeah. Um, so like for, and also others like uh, sometimes the model like incorrectly predicts where the curb is and it rides on the curb and stuff like that. But when it does that, it, there's no indication that there is a model failure happening. Um, and it doesn't, there's no loud beeps or anything. Like have you guys considered maybe like putting in like a warning system for like Yes, so two things that um, you use the word safety. Um, we have to be very careful about how we talk about safety. Um, so I talked a little bit about this. We have a safety model, uh, and to recap that, it guarantees that if you press, you're always able to retake control by pressing on the brake or the cancel button, and it'll never do anything um, too quickly for an attentive driver to take over. Um, so if that fails, that's perhaps a safety failure. Um, but anything that the model does or OpenPilot does is essentially considered QM. So your events are considered bad quality. Um, so it's just important to make the distinction there. And then as far as those things, we had this alert that kind of detected device falling, model uncertain. Um, we just found there was too many false positives. You would be pretty annoyed if you got one when it was very clear you shouldn't have gotten one. So we, we can revisit this. This was maybe a year ago that we removed it. But uh, I mean, I, I hope the, the bird one was pretty obvious for an attentive driver. Uh, I do have a question on safety. So yeah. uh, earlier we mentioned that there's, uh, we're going to increase or maximize the low speed torque. Yeah. So there are some uh, collaborators in, in the community, let's say for Subaru or for Hyundai HHG, yeah. um, that they want to get involved in this the, the implementation of the low speed torque. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we talked about that we have to do injection testing and we get in more data and more documentation on how the testings were done. So is there anything that you know, moving forward from the open pilot team that can provide some of that documentation publicly on how the community can get involved with that so we can kind of speed up the process or you know, anything like that? So the thing that's a little bit hard for the community to do is to get from zero to one on this. Um, so I would suggest that the community, you know, wait until we do it for the first car, which will probably be our EV6, um, because that's what we did for the taco car. Um, there's a, the first implementation of it in the taco branch um, for that car. And then the community is really good at taking from what do we go to zero to one and saying, okay, let's ship this on all 250 of our cars. Um, so I think that's the appropriate time for the community to get, to get involved. But the safety stuff is pretty accessible. If somebody wants to just get ahead of this, um, read ISO 15622 and ISO 11270. They're very readable. They even provide testing procedures. Um, so yeah, that's what I say about that. We've got a question upstairs. Hey, thanks. Uh, nice presentation. 
Thanks. I was curious if you guys um, also track the code coverage. Uh, yes. While this, you do? Okay, cool. Uh, what, tool do, what tool do you use? Uh, so we track it with CodeCov. Um, that's at 70% right now. But uh, it doesn't really cover everything. Uh, I mean, that 70% doesn't cover everything. So it's really quite a bit higher. Um, but we really better code coverage than just like line count. Uh, that's probably a project that we should do soon. Um, because it's not completely obvious. It's something that like a few of us have in our heads. Um, but it's not completely obvious to an external contributor, like I'm making a change, is this covered by the tests? Generally the answer is yes, um, especially for the things that the community tends to want to change. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's something we should drive up and we should really communicate when you're making a change, whether, uh, whether it's covered by the test and how well it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's what you really want with code coverage. Yeah, 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 cool, well, thanks. We've got one last question here. Hey, yeah, uh, general question. What does your system look like for learning from real world edge cases? So that's uh, another question for the research team. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Adim.